James. Thank, thank you, you, Chair. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Um, Mr. Reynolds, yes. come to you first, please. But I think the, the line of questions do apply to both um, experiences. I think we have a problem here in the distinction between what is an assessment for EHC and what is a plan or the plan. Yeah. So first, Mr Reynolds, how many applications do you receive for an EHC needs assessment? Um, so, so far this year, we've had 128 requests for assessment. In the whole of last year, we had 394. If I go back, 2017. That's okay. That's yeah. okay. Let's okay. just stick with those two figures. And of the 128, well, let, let's go for a full year. Okay. Of the 394 yeah. uh, applications for EHC needs assessment, is yeah. that is that right? Yeah. How many actually got the assessment? Not um, not the plan. The yeah. How many got the assessment? Um, the the number of requests that were agreed out of that was 309 and the uh, requests that we agreed not to assess were 38. Uh, the rest were withdrawn after discussion. So, so we refused 38 out of 394. Okay. And how are you determining somebody's um, successful application without assessing them? Um, it's, I mean, I think Newham is in a, in a different position to other authorities. The, the, overwhelmingly, the requests for assessment are of children who are already receiving level three or level four top-up funding in schools. So they have already been through a process of identifying they have additional needs and they require additional assessment. What they haven't had is a proper EHCP. So the vast but majority... The, yeah, OK, so my, my original point, uh, which I, I'm going to be like a dog with a bone on, okay. is to, to conflate what is an EHCP or an EHC plan yeah. and an EHC assessment. Yeah. Uh, actually, and we saw yesterday in the Timpson stuff, we probably need to revisit some of the labels we're using here because they are unhelpful. Yeah. But the assessment level is the, is, is the thing because the guidance talks about gatekeeping yeah. being unlawful. Yes. And I put it to you that you should be assessing everybody, determining different solutions and different conclusions, but that everybody that applies is worthy of an assessment, not a plan, but of an assessment. And yet, in the most recent complete year, uh, 38 were, uh, were, were declined and yeah. the remainder have not done the mass, uh, were advised against it or thought better of it or told not to, not to bother. But, well, How are you assessing that without uh, there being a fair assessment panel? Um, well, what, what's happening is that the, the experienced SEND officers are looking at the evidence that is presented of a need to assess if there is no evidence of a need to assess, that isn't a refusal, that's a seeking if there is any further information from the school and so on. Okay. But where the evidence is provided, that does not meet what we think is the appropriate threshold, we would say we're, we're not going to assess. Okay, thank you. And so I, I'm envisaging a, a sort of fork in the road yep. moment, okay, where a number of uh, young people have had their assessment application considered and you move some onto the EHC assessment work as is your requirement and you then uh, ordain a, a different direction for those children uh, and as I see from your website you call that the support plan yeah. so how are the needs for the child support, support plan at application stage only, determined to support their needs? At application, what, the, the referral for ass assessment, that decision-making process, how, are they, how is the need for a support plan determined then? So at application stage, how do you determine what, what, is, uh, what the content of that support plan is without the assessment? 
So if, if there's insufficient uh, evidence that the child needs an EHCP, but nevertheless the child would have some level of additional needs, that would be where we think that officers would talk with the school about what the support plan is that, that should be through the ordinarily available processes within the school that their devolved level of SEM funding should actually underwrite anyway. So it's not about the additional top-up funding and the additional EHCP, but the ordinary, as I said, the ordinarily available additional support that the school has through their SEND departments. So you would determine the requirements of each unique child based on the, the a format of funding that goes to that school? No, we, we don't determine the requirements. What we expect is schools to meet the needs of children that don't reach the threshold for an EHCP. It is no, 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 you are ignoring the distinction that is made clearly and I've made now between assessment and plan. Yes. The point is, it is not, your requirement is not to determine at reception stage, and, and Mr Gallimore's comments about triage I want to come on to, you are essentially determining an assessment based on application, not on assessment, at the stage of application. So you are determining a support plan for children based on, and your only answer has been about funding to the school, not the unique requirements of that child. And so, a simple question, because it may well be that the guidance uh, is, is wrong or misleading, and that's, that's a perfectly fine conclusion for us to draw. But at the moment, you are determining an application who to assess, and what I'm saying is your responsibility is to assess, not to give everybody a plan, but an EHC assessment is your requirement. So how do you determine what you call on your website as a support plan? A support plan sets out your child's needs, what support is needed to meet those needs, what progress the nursery or school expects your child to make once the plan is in place. So I am one of those children or a parent of one of those children. How have you assessed my needs based on my application? Uh uh, I haven't. My service hasn't. The support plan is the responsibility of the school. But it's a local plan. authority's requirement. The local authority, the guidance, must determine, must make a decision. Must so how, are, how is the local authority making that decision? So what we are doing is we have a referral for assessment and we are determining whether or not that referral for assessment meets the threshold to proceed to an assessment. Is that not what the guidance calls gatekeeping and is technically an unlawful practice? Um, I, I, haven't, I don't conceive it as that. There has to be a process. Okay. I'm assuming there has to be a process determination because otherwise... Why is there a process for whether or not to agree to assess? Because otherwise... The, the application would move to assessment, but there no, is no, a no. process in Look, six weeks. You, you, no, uh, uh, the, respectfully, that is demonstrably wrong in its interpretation of what the guy. The, po the problem should not be to stem the application numbers. Uh, it should be to assess correctly, full stop. Yes. Anything else, any move left or right of that is an unlawful practice according to the guidance. So when you talk up a support plan, which is essentially where you're parking the 38 children that you've de declined at application stage, how are you determining, as a local authority, that you, your duty of care has been done? Well, I think what we are doing is we're determining they don't meet the threshold for an assessment, and therefore our expectation is that the school will provide a support plan. OK, so that support plan is then in place based on an assessment done by the school that has previously felt the child was qualified to apply for an EHC plan, um, EHC assessment, sorry? It, the school may have done, but the bulk of the applications for an EHC plan in, in, our, in our authority don't come from schools, they come from parents. And of the 38, we'll just stick to that as the ones that you've declined at application, last year, um, how many of them have gone to tribunal, or what is your tribunal? Um, we, we had uh, last year, I think the figure was um, it, either two or three, two or three cases went to tribunal. Okay, and what success were those three cases? Um, 
what what or what was yeah. the result? Sorry. Well, I'm I'm very very averse to using the word success in terms of tribunal. What was the conclusion of the? That's a fair point. What was okay. the, the conclusion? So, so the tribunal of the two cases that I recall, one was found in favour of the authority, and one was found in favour of the parent. Okay. So of those that are. Uh, in discharging the local authorities' responsibilities, of those some 35, say, that didn't perhaps have the money to go to tribunal and uh, haven't further... What follow-up is there of those children and your assessment of that requirement? Um, could I... I would just like to take issue with not perhaps having the money. We work really hard to avoid tribunals because we think they're a failure. We have an, an officer... Uh, within the SEND team is our tribunal's officer who always works through mediation with parents to get a satisfactory conclusion, which yeah. is why we have very few go to tribunals. So it's not, and, and for example, we don't use any legal representation at tribunals. We don't put kind of financial obstacles in the way of parents taking us to tribunals. So I do want to make that point. Sure. No, I, I was referring just to the simply... The uh, decision of a parent to pursue yeah. it is going yeah. to be largely based on a financial uh, ability to, to, to do it. Okay, I mean, do you think the guidance is clear enough? Because I still feel that that is a gatekeeping uh, practice that, that is underway. I, I think it, there are clearly, in my experience working in different authorities, there are clearly different practices in determining what the threshold is, what meets the threshold, what what... Indi what individual services re regard as sufficient evidence of a move there. So I do think there is a variability in the system. Mm. Um, I think we try to be consistent within the authority, mm. but I agree that there, there is, there, there is uh, differences between authorities. And I do think having to have a decision whether or not to proceed to assess is necessarily a form of gatekeeping. Mm. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gallimore, you talked about triage as a yeah. good word, triage, really good word. If I present at a and &E, I am assessed by triage, but in your model of triage, you are, appear to be giving authority to the receptionist, not the triage uh, consultant, doctor, nurse. Could you just elaborate as to how, because I think it's fair enough to try and stem the number, uh, but I would, see, I would far sooner hear as to why you're priming SEN support in schools with better funding, better resources, etc., than simply by model saying, well, we're, sorry, mate, your name's not down, you're not, you're not coming in, which you alluded to, to doing on, in your description of triage. So can we perhaps just revisit that? Uh, uh, comment. Yes, certainly, and, and I mean, I don't recognise that that sort of parallel in terms of, you know, we're triaging using the the receptionist because I think that the um, process I was describing, um, which is not dissimilar to what Terry was saying, was was in terms of you are triaging with a you know with a skilled set of staff who are using the information that they have available to arrive at the view whether they've got enough or whether it's insufficient and what to do next. And I think the benefit of those listening on the outside, can we explain what triaging is or how you mean it? Yes, certainly, Chairman. So, I mean, I'm using, I am using triage to say that there, you know, that there does need to be a thoughtful process that identifies, based on the information that is available, what the next appropriate step is, and that that is a process to be gone through rather than leaping from point A to point C, that triage is a process of point B that does that in a, uh, in a thoughtful way. And I, I would agree, again, with Terry in terms of there is national difference, which might point to your original question about is the guidance tight enough or not? But I would be surprised if you are finding examples where that, you know, where there isn't thought being given to whether or not it is necessarily necessary to move to an EHCP assessment in all cases, or whether that young person's needs can be met at an earlier stage using the sort of school support plan that, that Terry is 
uh, is describing or, you know, or alternative forms of provision. So the same question to you then. <clears throat> How do you determine what requirement a child has in their support plan if you've declined their application for assessment? Well, declining the uh, application for an assessment for EHCP is not the same thing as saying that we are not working with schools, with health colleagues, with families to identify how that child's needs can be met and whether they can be met in different ways that doesn't require Great. going so, through so what, the So what does a local plan? Talk, talk me through that then. So if I've been uh, uh, sent to the support plan route, um, what local authority engagement is there? Well, you're, you're, you're looking through our SEND team about what the, uh, what the identified uh, needs are. It would normally have been generated as, as around a concern, uh, an inability uh, of that school to, to, meet, to meet that child's needs. And then it is in, in terms of a, a discussion uh, with that school, with that parent. And let's not forget in some instances also where it's you know, with the, the child and young person, mm. what else could be done that would mean that that child's need could be met in that setting. And that may be in terms of a world where you are topping up the school's funding for additional support, one-to-one -one support, whatever it may be, in terms of trying to identify that. That is not always going to be appropriate. And in some instances, it's absolutely clear that that child or young person needs the full ambit that comes through the EHCP uh, through that assessment process and through uh, you know, the, the resources that... Yeah, I, I mean, there, there is a distinction between plans, though, isn't there? EHCPs are not a homogenised uh, set of resources or, or, uh, or supports. And, and I would just, uh, on both, both comments, I would, uh, responses rather, I would just counsel against this, um, this judgement that, that a that, uh, proportion of children that determine themselves or have determined for them um, an application for EHCP uh, is a valuable exercise in a local authority, A, discharging the requirements that are on you that, are, that are perhaps not as clear as they need to be and the language needs tightening up, but that without assessment, I just put it to you, 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 are, you are ignoring at application stage a proportion of students that come to you and you yourself... Um, Mr. Gallimore talked about, well, average of 11% uh, of all children would come to you. Well, I, I think that on the first select committee hearings with the former Secretary of State, she said uh, between 13 and 14% of, of, of schools have SEN children. I, I put it to you, what is wrong with, with presuming that from within that 11% cohort, you as a local authority will assess their requirement and put them on a range of EHCPs or, or not, but that all, or up to all, do get assessed. We've got to move on to the next colleague. I, st my, I suppose my proposition is still that there are, there are other ways of responding to the needs of that group of young people than, you know, than the current process allows. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Mr Reynolds, um, I, I'm just read it, reading in more detail your website and I, I, I would ask that you uh, review it yourself uh, to check whether it is consistent with what is expected of you. 20% um, of, of the children that apply to Newham for an EHC assessment are being declined in two categories that you described to me earlier. Uh, one that were advised against it or discouraged and withdrawn and the other was a flat uh, decline or refusal. And yet your own website talks about an EHC plan for some children with complex needs, even the wide range of services available, if your child is still not making progress, even with support from your school, you can ask us to assess him or her for an EHC plan before then saying, when you ask for an assessment, we will need to decide whether or not your child needs one. 
there is an inconsistency here because what you are saying is if the school support isn't enough, the parent and the child can ask for an assessment of, for an EHC plan. That feels consistent with what is expected of you. But, but then that cohort that come to you with the application, you're sending a fifth of them away, even though they are the same group of children for whom you are telling they're entitled to if their current provision isn't up to it. So I think there's some real work to do in being consistent with the approach there. Either, I mean, and one, by the way, is unlawful, uh, and the other is inconsistent. So could I ask that you review that with your team and, and actually your chief executive, uh, which I think is a, is a real shame. I think you, you've both batted well for your, your chief executives. But at a time of reducing budgets, leadership is crucial. How people are being handled is crucial. And I think it's a failure of leadership that both the chief executives haven't turned up today. And diaries is a complete load of tosh. The idea that the Secretary of State can find time for the Education Select Committee, but the chief executive can't of a local authority is, is tosh. Um, so I would ask that you take that back and, and thank you for the uh, diligence in your answering earlier. Could, could I just say my chief executive has only been in post two, two weeks. An interim, chief executive, an interim chief executive is still a chief yes, executive, yeah. so either they're culpable. If I, if, I, if I were, as we've had from local authorities, uh, Essex yeah. or, um, uh, sorry, not Essex, Kent, who had come from Essex, or it may have been the other way around, but the point is he came as a new person, fully availed of the information and a determination to do it differently. New in post is not an acceptable position in defence of this. Um, but please, will you commit to reviewing that and report, report back?